Hi, I'm Sabine Yaakov. This presentation is entitled The Inner Works of Peak Current Mode Control. Now, don't miss the inner loop gain shown at the end of this presentation. Very interesting. Let me start off with some background. Now, Peak Current Mode is a very effective and highly popular control method of PWM power conversion system. Now, this presentation demonstrates by simulation the inner works of peak current mode control by examining various signal waveforms. Now, for the theory and intuitive explanation of peak current mode control, please see these two videos in my YouTube channel. Here are the links, and I'm also going to print the links in the description section of the video that you are now watching. So what is peak current mode? Peak current mode is different from voltage mode in which the duty cycle is actually generated in the regular voltage mode. Here, the duty cycle is actually built by the system itself. So what we have here is a clock of the switching frequency, just a, the beginning of the switching cycle. There is a flip-flop that is set by this clock. This turn on the driver to the gate. Now the current starts to rise in the inductor. And when the current reaches a certain level, which is set by this V sub E signal, then when this peak is reaching this signal, then the flip flop is reset and the switch is off. So what we have, we have a clock turning on the gate. Current is going up. When it reaches this level, it will turn off the flip-flop. So this is the end of the gate signal. And then by the next clock, things are repeating. And of course, if now VE is increasing, then the current of the inductor will sort of follow at the peak. Okay, so the peak will also sort of reach this level. So this is the idea of peak current mode. One advantage you can already see is that you can control cycle by cycle the current of the unit. That is, you can set VE to be to a certain maximum and therefore the current of the inductor or the switch will not go beyond it. So this is one very big advantage of peak current mode, but there are some other advantages. I'll talk about them later on. So in a power supply, what you do, you have the peak current mode modulator. This is the modulator that I just talked about. But then you have a sort of called outer loop. You sense the output, you compare it to a reference voltage, and this actually sets this V sub E level. So say if the voltage is too low, okay, this level will go up, the current of the inductor will increase, which will close the gap, so the output will reach the desired level as set by this V reference. So this is the way it works. Here I'm showing a boost converter. The current of the inductor is actually measured by this resistor. This is a filter. I'm not going into it in this presentation. You can of course uh, measure the inductor current by a sense resistor. Then you need an amplifier. Some controllers do have it. We'll see it later on. But this is the basic concept of a peak current mode control. So the peak current control actually has two loops. There is the inner loop of the current and then there is the outer loop of the voltage. Now you work with this loop closed and then you are controlling the output by the outer loop. Now it turns out that having a closed loop, an inner loop, which is actually controlling the current of the inductor, the state variable, you control the current of the inductor and therefore you might say you are actually reducing the order of the system. A regular DC to DC converter is a second order at least because you have an inductor and a capacitor which I'm not showing here. While if you sort of replace the inductor by a current source and here I'm showing it like this because in a closed loop the inductor becomes like a current source so you sort of get rid of the inductor. So the system becomes a first order, which is much easier to close the loop, to compensate. So you don't need a like type three compensator. It could be type two, like a lead lag. 
So therefore, the peak current mode is really very beneficial in terms of the dynamics of the system. There is, however, a problem with the peak current mode, already pointed out by the late Professor Middlebrook, and that is subharmonic oscillation. And here I'm showing here the geometrical interpretation, actually the explanation by Professor Middlebrook. And here is what is really happening. If the duty cycle generated by the system is lo lower than 0.5, then if this is the normal or expected current of the inductor, and if you have a disturbance, then due to this disturbance, you will hit the level earlier, and then you will end up with still some offset, which is smaller than the one that you began with. So therefore, in this case, the system will actually stabilize itself because the disturbances are sort of dying out. On the other hand, it can be shown by geometrical consideration that if the duty cycle is larger than 0.5, I mean the one generated by the system, then if you have a disturbance, then you'll end up with a disturbance which is larger than the one that you started with, and obviously this system is unstable because oscillation will start to build up. Now this is called subharmonic oscillation because you see that you start with a disturbance, you go to a disturbance which is negative, that is the other polarity, and then on the next cycle you'll have another disturbance which is the same polarity, so the frequency of this disturbance is actually half the frequency of the switching. This is the switching cycle and the oscillations will be twice this period. So this is a problem that has been noticed many many years ago and there is a remedy to it and the remedy is to add the so-called slope compensation. So rather than having a constant level here, we add a slope here to this level so it goes down, and here I'm showing it in a sort of an illustrative way how is this slope is really helping. So what we see here is if we have the slope and we have the disturbance, you hit the slope earlier, and consequently as you go down now, the disturbance actually can be made smaller depending on the slope. So this is a technique that is used by most peak current mode control system, and it is sort of built in. You can have the slope like this, or you can actually add a slope on the other direction, that is a positive going, to the current itself, or the replica of the current, because what is really important is this rate of closure, you might say, here. So either you have the slope here, or you have a level here, and then you add the slope here, it'll be the same. So this is a problem that can be overcome, and it is done in, of course, most systems that need to work above duty cycle of 0.5. Sometimes you design a system that will be limited with a duty cycle below 0.5, then you actually don't need it. So to have a look at the waveform and really what is going on inside this complex control system, I've set up a generic current mode model. Here is the flip-flop, that's the heart of the thing. We have the switching frequency pulses coming in. I'm sorry, this was sort of chopped off. These are 100 kilohertz short pulses, which are setting this flip-flop. And this flip-flop now is actually generating this uh, voltage here, which is one volt, which I'm amplifying it by this dependent voltage. So we have here 10 volt coming in. So this is like the midpoint in a half a bridge, okay? And then we have this uh, comparator, which on the one side has this reference. This is the level that we are comparing the current of the inductor, and the current of the inductor is replicated here by this dependent source, so the voltage here is the current of the inductor. So once this current is reaching this level, or the replica of it, the voltage representing it, then the reset will be on and the Q will go down and this will be the end of the pulse. So this is a generic representation of this whole idea of peak current mode. So let's see how does it operate. 
here we have a reference for the current of the inductor which is sort of slowly going up and we can see here the inductor current following it well, there's some missing here the, this is because of the response of the comparator and you see that the current of the inductor is, is really following it and here is the duty cycle that has been generated now let me just say that the voltage here is 10 volt so if the output is say 1 volt then the duty cycle is 0.1 this is the buck converter so here we have a duty cycle this is V out of 1.5 so we don't have problem of subharmonic oscillation and of course if the reference goes up and the current goes up then the output also goes up and here is the duty cycle well it's about 0.15 whatever uh, this should be like 0.15 and here is the basic operation of the unit now if I push this reference to a higher level and the output is above 5 volt, which is a duty cycle of 0.5, you see this subharmonic oscillation. So we see here that up to here it's okay, and then it starts here oscillating, and this is very bad. Uh, it could harm the system. Also, you have an output now, a low frequency deviation, and it could be higher and higher. So this is a very bad situation. And what you do, you can remedy this by the slope compensation rather than having a down going slope i have added an up going slope to the current here it is this the the slope is generated here this is the slope here so thereby i'm adding actually this uh, slope compensation and here it is you see now we are at a duty cycle of 0.9596 this is the duty cycle uh, this is the current everything is fine this is the slope itself that I've added, and this is now the current plus the slope, okay? So this is the current plus the slope, and you see that everything is working very, very nice. Now, as I've said, a big advantage of the peak current mode control is that it is reducing the degree of the system. So rather than having a second order, we have a first order system, so the compensation is simpler. So now I'm just looking at the behavior of the outer loop. So but I'm doing it by adding here an excitation, a sinusoidal excitation for this reference. And this is like a chirp signal, the time square. Uh, this makes it like a sinusoidal waveform which is increasing with frequency, with time. And then I'm be looking at the output and see how is this output is affected by this reference signal so here it is this is the reference signal you see that the frequency is sort of going up and here is the output well i didn't go into the fine details of the numbers here but you can clearly see that uh, the amplitude is going down and i can assure you it's at 20 db per decade and that uh, you don't have any peaking here meaning that there is no uh, second order effect so this is like a first order system and here is the close up of the system again we are at a small duty cycle like a 0.16 this is the output this is the excitation signal you see the current is following it and here is the duty cycle accordingly generated uh, by this process. Now, if the duty cycle is about 0.5, like here it's 0.667, we start to have this subharmonic oscillation, very nasty, very bad, you see the output. And to remedy this, we can add the slope as I did before. Once you do it, everything comes to be in order, everything is fine. So this is the remedy that you can use to arrest this uh, subharmonic oscillation. Now I'm going to look at a commercial unit. It's a DC to DC converter. It's a peak current mode. You, you see here a sense resistor which goes into actually an amplifier because the signal here is low. Everything of course is here or the control and then we have at the outside the transistor, the power transistor slope compensation is supposedly built in so let's have a look at this 
And here I am running it at the duty cycle. This is the duty cycle. This is the midpoint. So this is actually the duty cycle. You see it's uh, what, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. It's fairly high. And you see that the inductor current is very nice. Uh, triangular waveform, no oscillation. Everything is fine. So obviously this unit has built in a slope compensation. Now operating in peak current mode, the order of the system is lower. So therefore the compensator could be simpler. What we see here is the compensation network. This is actually usually the output of a transconductance amplifier. It shows here a capacitor, but in fact it has a resistor inside and a parallel capacitor. So this is the network. This is very typical of a lead lag compensator. It's a type 2, which of course is okay for this case in which we have peak current mode control. Now I'm going to show something which I don't think that many of you have seen, and that is what is the loop gain of the inner loop, the current loop. So to do this, first of all I'm putting here an excitation. I'll explain the reason for it in a second. And also I'm actually neutralizing the outer loop. This is done by clamping the voltage here to a voltage source. So the feedback, the voltage feedback doesn't make any difference anymore. We are now controlling the level at which the inductor current will reach. The peak value of the inductor current is controlled by this signal. So by setting here to 1.7, it will come to a given point. Of course, there's some scaling here between the current and voltages, etc. But the point is that now there is no outer loop operating. Okay? So there is only the inner loop. So what I did here is the following. I've added an excitation to the loop of the current. Now this is a very well known, of course, technique for looking at loop gain in closed loop. Okay? So by having this signal, and looking at the ratio between this volt and this volt, this will be actually the loop gain, the measure of the loop gain. Now for those who are not very familiar with this, let me explain it with this circuit, which perhaps is simpler to understand. Now rather than having this source in series, I can represent it in this way. This is like a summing point, okay, this, this whole thing. We have here excitation, we have here the feedback coming out, okay, this is here, and here we have the feedback coming in, okay. Now the feedback coming in is the sum of this plus this, okay, or minus this depending on the polarity, exactly like here. F feedback in is this voltage plus this voltage. So here it's done by a source which is connected in series, and here it is shown like a summing point. So this voltage is this plus this, or this minus this, depending on polarity. So this is actually what we are doing. Now obviously, if you have a system like that, and you have access to this point and this point, then the ratio between this and this is the loop gain. Because you start here, you go all the way, you go come back, and therefore this signal divided by this signal is in fact the loop gain. Now the difference here is of course the excitation, okay? So this doesn't change, but the ratio of this and this is the loop gain. So here it is what I'm getting. This is the in, feedback in, and this is the feedback out, and one is on top of the other. And lo and behold, it would mean and here I have it in an expanded scale, and here it even zoomed in. Now it is obvious that the output is very close to the input. So it seems that in this case the loop gain is 1. This is very strange. We are not used to this at all. Phase is the same. There is no phase difference. So the loop gain is 1 in this circuit. Now what does it mean? Okay. Let's have a look at this system, and I'm redrawing it a little bit so we can do some calculation here. So what I did, I actually moved this to the bottom. So this looked like a classical 
feedback system. A is one, this is the system is like one, and this is the feedback. Loop gain, of course, is always the total value here, okay? So we already said that the loop gain is this ratio between this and this. Now, the gain between here and here, like in any system, is the transfer function of A of the system, which is one here, divided by one minus loop gain. This is the classical expression for a feedback system. I am not assuming that LG is negative. I'm just taking it in its right polarity. So this is why this is z minus here. Now it turns out that this loop gain now is approaching one. This is what we have seen by simulation. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that the gain here is very large. So that is, I have a small excitation here, okay? And the voltage here should be, or expected to be, much larger than the excitation, because this number is approaching one, so this is a large number. So let's see what's really happening. Now the excitation is 10 millivolt. And now the feedback in and out and they are the same, just about the same, are about 400 millivolt. Uh, peak to peak, it's about 800, so it's 400 millivolt. So we have a gain of 40. If we have a gain of 40, and so if this is 40, and now I can extract actually the a more precise or more accurate uh, or, or better estimate of the loop gain, and it turns out to be 0.975. Amazing. So this is very peculiar, very different from what we are used to in regular feedback system. But let me just point out that we are talking here about a non-linear system. I'm looking at it with a linear eyes, you might say, with a li linear approach, which is sort of linearizing everything. But the system is non-linear, and the behavior of a non-linear system could be quite different. I have not taken into account also the delay because there is a sampling delay here. But again, looking it from outside, here is what you see. You see that the loop gain of this system, the signal coming in and the signal coming out is about the same and the value of the loop gain is about one. So this is actually the end of this presentation, but I was curious to see if AI, what we are all talking about these days, like Chat GPT 3.5, which is free, of course, what is Chat GPT has to say about this whole issue of subharmonic oscillation that we have just discussed? So I've posed this query, this question, how to correct for subharmonic oscillation in peak well, it should be current mode. And the answer is that correcting subharmonic oscillation in peak current mode involves several steps, etc. And here are the steps. Feedback loop compensation. Well, this is the wrong answer because this is not a feedback loop compensation that you need. Secondly, it says frequency response analysis. Well, that's always fine, but it has nothing to do with the issue. Noise filtering, the same thing, very nice, but has nothing to do with the subharmonic oscillation. Component selection, well, that's very good. Layout and grounding, clearly very important, but not to the issue of subharmonic oscillation. Simulation and testing, iterative approach. And then it sums out by following these steps and carefully analyzing behavior of the peak current mode control loop, you can identify and mitigate subharmonic oscillation to achieve stable and reliable operation of the power supply. Well, it would seem that we have to send chat GPT back to school, but I'm afraid that there is something missing here in the chat GPT, and that is a brain. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.